Hey, man, are you, you playing Pokemon? What's it to you? Hey, idiot, you know, people are running into to things like dumpsters, brick walls. Well, it looks like you just ran into one yourself. You're in my way. Get hey, out of here. No. Hey, I'm just chilling out here. I'm trying protecting your ass, buddy, actually. You're protecting me. I'm protecting you. You protecting me. New York protecting Boston. Well, <laughs> hey, I don't want you to All get right. hurt. Y yeah. You know? Yeah, go have people a Starbucks. People got killed. Go you? around the corner. There's a Starbucks there. You'll be in your element. Go. Hey, I like Starbucks. Why do you think it's Starbucks? Why do you think it's more money? Big Apple. Everything's the best than the Big Apple. Because it's crap. Yeah, there's a Dunkin' Donuts over there. That's where I'm going. So you're in no, my way. Go ahead. Come on. Thank you. All right. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, so, you think uh, you're so tough. You, know, you got yeah. Martin Scorsese on your side, right? Hey, there's nothing better than yeah. the good fellas. Are you kidding me? The good best. Fellas, good mean fellas. streets. Well, you know what? Mean streets. We taxi got, driver. Yeah, well, we got the departed. Scorsese saw the error of his ways. He came around. He yeah. came to New England. He came to us. Departed? Yeah. Departed's pretty good. I'm pretty not good. sure it's the best. Pretty good. Not pretty sure good. it's the best. No. All right. Well, we'll let these guys decide here. All right. All right. Martin Scorsese. New York Scorsese, taxi driver, mean streets, or the departed? 2006's best picture winner. All right. We'll see. Cops or criminals. What I'm saying is this. When you're facing a loaded gun, what's the difference? This is not the regular police. This is the state police. We are an elite unit. This is who we're after. Frank Costello. You won't be paid as a regular cop, but there's a bonus involved. So what do I do? You will not ever know the identity of undercover people. You have anyone in with Costello presently? Maybe. Do you know who I am? Maybe not. I'm gonna have my associates search you. That was quick. Think he's dead already? Get your hands off me! I think we could work something out. We are all convinced that Costello has at least one mole inside the Special Investigations Unit. There are parts of my job I can't talk to you about. Man, you are trouble. You don't know the half of it. You better get organized, quick. Hey, last time I checked, I tipped you off and you're not in jail. Getting the feeling we got a cop in my crew. Soon a lady's gonna find out who I am and he's gonna kill me. I can get the rap. You just gotta let me do it my way. If you don't, it won't be me who pays for it. Leaks from the inside. It's real, man. Smoke him out. You're lying to me. There are things you don't want to know about. What are you waiting for, honestly? I mean, do you want him to chop me up and feed me to the poor? Is that what you guys want? How's your brother? She's on her way out. You all are. Act accordingly. All right, well, that's The Departed, 2006, the movie that finally got Scorsese his best director Oscar, his long overdue Oscar, his Boston movie, his long overdue Oscar. I know. It's a great movie. It's a great movie. It is a great movie. I, I mean, there's so many twists and turns in there at the end. It's like a, a, a what do you, what'd you call it? Uh, a New York, what's, what's the, uh, there's a, a term for it, New York, I don't know, riddle, whatever. Crime thriller. Crime thriller. It's just, New York crime thriller. Yeah, it's, it's. Gritty, gr gruesome, yes. brutal. Yes. I love, I love, I love the opening, opening uh, lines in this, because I actually, I had, actually wrote it down when he said, uh, um, when I was your age, Frank Costello says, when I was your age, they say you can become a cops or criminals. And he goes, today, what I'm saying to you is this, when you're facing a loaded gun, what difference does it make? What, what, mm. a, what a cool line to start. Might those be words to live by. Yes. Yeah, you know. Well, this was a remake of a Hong Kong film called, well, translated, Infernal Affairs from 2002. Infernal Affairs. Mm -hmm. And 
So there's, there was a lot of speculation as to why this film, why the Academy decided this was the film to anoint Scorsese as his best. Right. And was it one of those, you're long overdue, so we'll give it to you now, or were his earlier films better? And that's pretty much the New York-Boston debate that we have going here, is which are his, which are his better films? Films like Taxi Driver, yeah. Mean Streets, yeah. films like Goodfellas, as opposed to films like The Departed. Yeah, well, one thing I, I, I saw is that um, he said that this is like one of the first movies he had. He did that has because he has a plot to it, which is odd to say, odd to hear him say that because Goodfellas, I mean, Goodfellas had the plot. You know, it had um, Ray Liotta pretty much was the guy. You know, with the, the cocaine and and um, um, you, you know the story was about him how he finally ended up taking the fall at the end. Yeah, yeah, um, well, I can see that. I see what you're saying because most of his earlier films were. I guess you could say they were more character studies than anything else. I mean, yes. look at Mean Streets. This is a thug That's who's right. racked by his Catholic guilt. Mm -hmm. And you look at Taxi Driver. This is the depiction of this guy who was going through this psychological breakdown. That's right. And you look at The Departed, and you have this intricate web of different characters. You have Leo DiCaprio. You have Jack Nicholson. You have Matt Damon. You have Vera Farmiga. You yeah. have all of these different characters yeah. who all have equal or relatively equal significance in how everything plays out. So, yeah. Well, the other thing about point. the de Departed, I think, was just the amazing cast that he put together. Like you just said. Well, the cast was high caliber. You I can't mean, get any. And the story was so intricate because every, I mean, the police had a rat, his criminal group had a rat, and basically we find out. I'm not going to tell you. You need to watch that movie. <laughs> Someone else in that in his uh, criminal. Uh, and his posse had, was a rat in his group. So, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and, and the ending is just, uh, it blows your mind. It blows your mind. Well, you speaking know? of endings that uh, really toy with what your expectations are, what's our next film? The next film, I think we're going to go with Gone, Baby Gone, um, which is, uh, it's, a, it's a directed by Ben Affleck. Um, it's, <clears throat> it's a very good story. Um, it's about a kidnapping of a, of a, of a four-year-old girl. And these people, actually, they grew up. It's, it takes place in South Boston. It could be much more grittier and couldn't have more, you know, the type of people that are in that area. You know, that, in fact, Ben Affleck said he didn't want to have any extras that were professional extras. He wanted to have people from that area that were like the normal people that grew up there. And, Case, and Ben Aff, I mean, Casey Affleck stars in it with... Um, I think Bridget Monaghan, and um, and they're detectives, and they live in the town, and they're trying to help. So they know these people, and they're trying to rescue or find out what about this kidnapping for the girl. So uh, let's see this trailer. Elaine puts her to bed. She goes across to Dottie's, then she comes home, and Amanda is gone. Who would take my little girl? She never hurt anybody. A four-year-old child is on the street. If we don't catch the abductor by day one, only about 10% are ever solved. This is day three. Do you know people in the neighborhood who don't talk to the police? One or two. We want to hire you to augment the investigation. I just want my daughter back. It's all right, we're gonna find her. You have to promise me. I promise. Have you ever investigated an abduction before? I think Mr. McCready was hoping that we could help with the neighborhood aspect of this investigation. Half the guys you know are degenerates. And you know what the other half are? What? Cops. Don't hold it against me. Guess who? You asked me to find some people for you. I think I found them. Are you saying you didn't do it? Fine. If it turns out you're lying, I'm going to bribe cops to go after you, and I'm going to tell everyone I know that you're a CIA and a rat. And I know a lot of people. At least two guns in the house. What else? Squad will be here in five minutes. You're not gonna wait for them? You're not waiting. He lied to me. I can't think of one reason big enough for him to lie that's small enough not to matter. You better think long and hard before you start running around here investigating the police. Let it go. Coming here trying to get noble, boy. And don't try to take on something you don't have the shoulders for. You gotta take a side. If you beat a child, you're not on my side. If you see me coming, you better run because I'm gonna lay you down. This child, it's all I care about. I'm gonna bring her home. Tell 
home, I'm sorry. Oh my God. How much? What did you do? Where I come from, you die with your secrets. This is the kind of thing that if you do, Patrick, you want to be sure. Are you sure? No. This is a film that really toys with your emotions. I'm not going to give away the last 20 minutes or so, but I will say that this is not your typical straightforward crime thriller. This is set in Southie, as most of Ben Affleck's films are, yeah. and it's a very compelling piece because it takes a look at this kidnapping of this four-year-old girl and the mother who puts on the weepy face for the press, mm -hmm. Amy Ryan, in an Oscar-nominated role as the mother, um, she puts on this, this weepy face for the press, but she really sees this as nothing more than a huge inconvenience, a disruption to her social life. Mm, social life true. being composed, basically, of, of bat hopping and, and, uh, and, and drug taking. Yeah. Um, her brother and sister-in-law, who are clean and sober, her brother and sister-in-law, they very much uh, want this four-year-old girl back. They want to protect her from this horrifically unqualified mother she has. So they're really the ones who are spearheading this effort to, to find this little girl. And It's interesting because uh, the police get involved in it and, uh, and uh, was it Ed O'Neill? Who was it? Um, not Ed O'Neill. Um, I can't think. The, the, the detective that uh, is supposed to be helping. Oh, Ed Harris. Ed Harris. Ed Harris. Ed Harris is helping uh, Casey Affleck in this. He's not quite the detective you would think he would be. You know, he's not quite doing things um, to, to, well, he is to help, but not really. <laughs> it's, 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 it's very convoluted, actually. I mean, they're trying to help save this girl in a way, um, but uh, even the police go out of police procedure to do it. I would say is the best way to put it, perhaps. Yeah. Well, the right. lines of good and bad are definitely blurred. blurred. There's yes. no clear distinction. This is yeah. not your typical, no. these are the good guys, these are the bad guys. Even Casey no. Affleck, who is the lead character, the one right. who is really on the mission mm -hmm. to find this, this little girl, uh, he and his girlfriend both, um, even between yeah. the two of them, he and his girlfriend, their dynamic is, yeah. is uh, thought-provoking to say the least. Yeah, and the interesting thing about it, it's based on a book by Dennis Lehane, who's really, he's from South Boston. And I read the book, and he is, his, his writing is just as good and just as visual as what shows up on, uh, in, in his movies. Um, he's a great, I mean, he's, he's just a great writer of crime thrillers, and he really keeps you on the edge of your seat. And this will too, even though, and it'll take some turns and twists that you don't necessarily expect to happen. And, and uh, the resolution is not what you expect to happen either. No, no, it's not. And one final note uh, but, about the cast of this film. Mm -hmm. uh, in a bit part, he's on screen for less than a minute total, but in a bit part as the mother's, one of the mother's uh, dates, we'll say, uh, is actor Sean Malone, who uh, not too long ago, maybe within the past year or so, um, he actually died in a drowning accident. Mm -hmm. um, right off of the uh, of Boston, the, 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 the Atlantic Ocean. Um, I yeah. met him briefly once. Uh, yeah. He and yeah. I were um, on an airplane together, mm -hmm. and we were talking, and he happened to mention that he was an actor. He was flying back from L.A. Yeah. having just done a direct TV commercial. Really nice guy. Mm -hmm. um, so I was shocked when I read the article. I read something about him like that he didn't even audition. He just went in there and, and, and like did some sort of rant, and uh, Affleck liked him so much that they just instantly hired him to do the role. Yeah. Well, he was good. He was he good. Was for for a, such limited screen time, he certainly made the most of it. And he was, like I said, really nice guy. So that was, you know, just wanted to pay a little tribute to, uh, okay. to him. So what's our next so, uh, exciting movie? Well, you mentioned, Ryan's thriller. you <laughs> mentioned author Dennis Lehane. Yep. And he also wrote a book called Mystic River. Yep. And that's the next film we'll talk about. This film is from 2003. And it is directed by Clint Eastwood. And it stars Sean Penn and Kevin Bacon and Tim Robbins and long before Spotlight it's a Boston movie that takes a look at the very troubling uh, issue of abuse of children and this is a mm -hmm. film that is right. difficult to watch but not for the same reasons as your typical Boston crime thriller meaning it's not just 
gangsters and cops no. and shoot 'em ups. It's much more. It's much more uh, dramatic, dramatic, compelling, thought-provoking material. So it is. let's take a look at Mystic River. That's right. Hey, Divine. What you looking at? The old neighborhood. There are places that make us who we are. Save! I used to play on the street when I was a kid. Where were you? Moments that give us hope. Do not make her laugh. Where have you been? Feelings that make us question our beliefs. Fears that trigger our darkest emotions. It's my daughter's car. He sent my daughter in there! He sent my daughter in there! Oh, God! <laughs> For a couple of seconds on Saturday, she looked at me like she was preparing to never see me again. You don't think I'd have hurt her, do you? She isn't hurt, Brendan. She's dead. I loved her so much. I know in my soul I contributed to your death, but I don't know how. I'm gonna find him with love, please. I'm gonna find a man and I'm gonna kill him. You know what I was thinking about? Vampires. Maybe one day you wake up and you forget what it's like to be killed. Maybe then it's okay. You're not making any sense. Sometimes I think, oh, well, this is just a dream, you know? How about you tell us what really happened Saturday night, Mr. Boyle? And why is your wife acting like she's afraid of you, huh? Everyone is weak. Everyone but us. You could rule this town. You bury us in here. Run! Run! This, this was a great picture. Uh, you know, besides dealing with child abuse, you know, it, it, it actually, the plot of it is that his, Sean Penn, um, who was one of these, they were like really good friends back in the, you know, when they were kids, and what happened, and Tim Robbins and, and um, Kevin Bacon, um, they're in there, and one of them gets abducted. And uh, it, it influences everything else that happens in their lives. But the plot of the story is actually that um, Sean Penn's daughter gets, uh, she gets killed. And the mystery is about finding out what happened and, how, and, and who did it. And Sean Penn is like an ex-con now who um, has his own business. And he's the father. And... Um, He's actually the central, the central character in the movie. And, and Kevin Bacon is the police detective who's trying to help out now that they're all grown. And uh, Tim Robbins is the friend who's kind of like, he's definitely, uh, what's the word, broken in a way. Mm. And everything that seems to happen in that movie goes back to uh, the actions that they had. When, like Kevin Bacon makes a statement in there. It's like, we never got out of being 11 years old in that movie mm. because of uh, what happens. And um, it, it does involve all three of them, but the acting was superb in there. I mean, Sean Penn won the Best Actor Award and uh, Tim Robbins did. And I think it was the first duo that won the best, you would know this more than I maybe, that won the best actor and supporting actor roles uh, since Ben-Hur. I think I read that somewhere. Mm. Yeah, no, it's no. You're right. It's it's interesting uh, about this film is that the cast is very stellar, like you said, and Sean Penn and Tim Robbins uh, both did win the awards for this film, and these could not have been easy roles to play. I no. don't care if in real life as an actor you are a parent or not. It's not an easy role to play, no. and it really takes a look at the troubling question of to what extent are you willing to take the law into your own hands, That's justice right. into your own hands. And it's similar territory that Tim Robbins and Sean Penn explored earlier in their collaboration 
1995, Dead Man Walking. Uh, Tim oh, Robbins yeah, directed right. Sean Penn and Susan Sarandon in that yeah, one. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's sort of a continuation of an exploration of that theme, but it's also a very, it's much less diplomatic than Dead Man Walking is. This is a very different kind of film. Dead Man Walking left a lot of questions for you with what would I do in this situation, mm -hmm. whereas Mystic River, you're taking a look at what the characters do decide to do, and you say to yourself, is this something I would have done? And yeah, I know. it's yeah. very, it, in that sense, it's very, um, it's, it's very, it, it's, it's, it's hard to watch. It's, it's not an it's, easy movie to watch, but none of these movies are. I mean, these no. are Boston crime thrillers. That's in fact, right. Clint Eastwood, who directed it, uh, the studio very much wanted him to film this movie in Toronto, to film Mystic River in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, he refused. He said, this has got to be, it's set in Boston. We need to film it in Boston. Yeah. We need the real backdrop, the real Mystic River. So he prevailed, and it was he filmed did. here. In fact, I also read that Kevin Bacon was a last-minute substitute for Michael Keaton. That would have been they, interesting to see Michael, Michael Keaton, Keaton I guess that he, had, he had an argument with, yeah, I would have liked, that would have been good, too. But Kevin Bacon was excellent in this movie. Mm -hmm. And it was a gut-wrenching performance from uh, Sean Penn. I mean, he went through every single emotion that, it, that, that a human being can go through certainly earned the award yeah. for this. But uh, the next movie we're going to talk about will be, um, I guess we'll go to the Boondock Saints. Boondock Saints, Boondock Saints. which is, it's a cult favorite movie because the th what happened was this movie came out, it's all, it takes place in Boston. Um, it, it came out when, uh, the, shortly before, after the Columbine murders, actually. Mm. So they didn't get widespread release and very limited. And he ended up making, uh, it ended up making not very much money at, at the theaters, at the box office, but it became a cult favorite. And it is to this day, you know, uh, it's like one of those crime thrillers that really is a crime thriller. And really it's about taking, talk about talking, taking the law in your own hands. This movie does a heck of a job doing that with the McManus brothers, so maybe we should watch the trailer on this one. On the streets of Boston. This was no gangland assassination. It was way too sloppy. Something went wrong here. An FBI agent is on a case. All the low lowlifes in the quiet city of Boston start dropping dead, and you think it's unrelated. They're all bad guys. Now they're all dead bad guys. The victims are the mob. What we have here, gentlemen, is the beginning of the first international mob war. And the hitmen think they're on a mission from God. Anybody you think is evil, don't you think that's a little weird, a little psycho? Sort of like 7-Eleven. We're not always doing business, but we're always open. That is nice and good. <laughs> it was two shooters. Bang, freaking fantastic. This guy's very sharp. He hasn't figured this out yet, he will. All we know is what we found out from the neighbors. And the general consensus is, they're angels. In a place where the violent have the power. Destroy all that which is evil, so that which is good may flourish. One lawman doesn't know whether to catch the killers. I believe what they do is necessary. Or join them. All the things I wish I could do, these guys are doing. With every breath, we shall hunt them down. Each day, we will spill their blood. There was a firefight! <laughs> They want to wipe out evil in Boston, in South Boston, especially in their neighborhoods, and uh, they get a, they gain a following for doing that. Um, and they're trying to get rid of the mobs, the, the the mafia, the Russian mob is coming in there. They're trying to take over um, their friends' bar, and uh, these are the McManus brothers, Norman Reedus 
who's in Walking Dead is one of the one of them, and um, the other one um, I can't think of his name. <laughs> the other actor, he's a good actor, um, but uh, they're uh, they just take they take the law into their own hands and they gain a following. And Willem Dafoe, who plays the um, police detective, um, at first is going after them, but at first sees what they do and kind of like. Has, has a has a almost a clairvoyant ability to see to understand what's happened in each crime scene that he goes to. He, he's just amazing in this role, and um, and he and he, he decides to side with them at some point. But uh, they take it way too far. <laughs> I won't tell you about the <laughs> ending, but um, it's you know it's a question about whether or not people are, should be allowed to take the law into their own hands which is kind of like very much of a contemporary thing today in some ways mm. i would say well this is a movie that really in hindsight you take a look at it and just remembering the context in which it was in initially released you have here a story about these twin brothers these fraternal twins right. and there is established in the first 15 minutes of the movie alone there is established this notion of, of loyalty. They're inside this bar, mm -hmm. and the owner or the manager of the bar, uh, they're very friendly with, so they have this brotherly bond, this right. bromance, if you will, and in comes this Russian mob, right. and their words are exchanged, threats are tossed back and forth, and there is this sense that they will defend this guy, this Bar, right. this bartender, this bar owner, they will defend them, these twins, uh, to the best of their ability. And so you have these scenes, very grisly scenes, played out. Yes. And they're very, they're very explicit, but underlying all of it, you have this sense that they feel morally justified That's right. in what they are doing because they are sticking up for those who have always been right by, who have always done right by them, who have always been good to them. Mm -hmm. So are their methods of showing that loyalty questionable? Well, yes, but that being their motivating, their motivating factor, this loyalty, it sheds some insight into what very easily could have been just simply one-dimensional cardboard stock characters of these gangster types. Um, That's true. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I think uh, it it's almost has a, um, I don't know, like like over the top violence because it, they have uh, like they have classical music playing in the background when they're in their I think when they fall through a duct to, to kill the Russian mob, and it's just it's classical music and playing and it, while that's going on, almost like a, a, a symphony, a symphony of violence. And which, that's pretty much what is, it was. It was <laughs> if a you think about it. It was. It was. But. Uh, and actually, I read that the director, Troy, Troy Duffy, he came up with this idea. He had never written a screenplay before, and he came up with this idea when, um, um, when he was inspired, he said, by his disgust at seeing a drug dealer taking money from a corpse across the hall from his apartment. And he was working as a bartender and a bouncer at the time, and then he just wrote the screenplay. and. Uh, Miramax wanted it right away, and I think a lot of yeah, I think a lot of people were afraid to. The studio wanted it. Miramax wanted it. People, right, because of the timing, the unfortunate timing. Um, right, it just wasn't. I think it was. A, it was. A, it was in turnaround. I think they languished it, and then they came back. It said like like so many other films that came yeah. out around that same time, violent films that came out after the Columbine massacre, Fight Club, for example. Yeah, um, that would, a, lo a lot of these films uh, probably yeah, it was so took a step yeah. back and out of respect. But over the years, you know, the home video market and you know DVD and all of that, you know, newer generations uh, see yeah. these films, and a lot of them find artistic value in these films. And you have yeah. Well, you, sp you take a look at an actor like Willem Dafoe, right. who is. Brilliant. I mean, we're he talking, he was in Platoon, he's yeah. an Academy Award nominee for Shadow of the Vampire. Yeah. But he was in the, plays last, the Last Temptation of Christ. Last Temptation of Christ with Scorsese. With, with Scorsese. Um, but here he is in the Boondock Saints, right. and this alone just speaks to the art of acting. He is, as he plays his character, just as capable of analyzing this crime scene where you see these 
literally, you have these mutilated bodies, bodies these yeah. corpses on the ground in this alleyway, right. surrounded by all of this broken porcelain. Just watch the film and you'll see That's what right. I'm talking about. That's right. And he is just as capable of discussing the grisly details of this crime in the same breath as turning to someone and ordering a coffee. And That's how right. he wants the coffee to That's be, right. you know, That's two right. sugars or whatever he says, and a bagel. That's right. It's true. So yeah. there is this almost, well, there is this desensitized, almost cavalier from this particular character, mm. cavalier sense of been there, done that. This is just another day in the job for me, and yeah. you know that's that. I can see how that except, kind of an attitude except, would be very troublesome right. in the spring of 1999. Right, and then when they run the credits and they're asking people on the street, right, about whether or not they thought that the vigilante justice was, you know, do you do you condone it? Do you do you think it's it's a positive or a negative, right? Watch the end credits yeah. to this film, The Boondock Saints, alone, and you will swear on your life that this is actual news footage from today's day and age. I know. It's sad. It is. It's sad. It's frightening. It's and concerning. It's, right. But maybe that's the point. Maybe it's, it's good that it gets you to think this way because... We can't change anything about the state of affairs in the world today unless we actually face the reality of what that state of affairs really is. And the end credits, like you said, yes. they talk about vigilante justice. They talk about uh, you know what's what's uh, justified and what's not. It talks about how we, as a society, tend to, or at least sometimes, have the inclination towards putting these vigilantes on this pedestal, are they heroes, are they not? You know, these are people right. who are technically, officially on the wrong side of the law. They are armed, they are dangerous, but they fight for yeah. what they think is right. And so yeah. is that something that society should embrace or is that something that we should yeah. completely not condone and try to do something about? I think, I think that's probably, that might be why they actually st put that in at the end of the movie, because I don't think he wants to leave with a statement saying that it's okay for you to go out and take the law into your own hands. So maybe right. he was looking for that balance from people on the street to actually say, you know, yeah, they're right. You can't just go out and shoot somebody on your own. You have to go follow the laws. And you actually have in the end credits, yeah. you have, right. uh, these are extras in That's these right. roles, but you have these people being interviewed on the street right. and you have two people interviewed at once and they're disagreeing and right. they actually get into an argument and one says, I can't stand next to you and That's right. storms off. And That's so, right. I mean, they really play it out very realistically, so. What's our next movie then? Uh, so, oh, the next movie we'll be taking a look at is a pretty uh, relatively new release. Black Mass is what it's called. And it is a look at the true story of I hesitate to say his name, but James Whitey Bulger. That's right. And it's Johnny Depp playing this notorious criminal, this monster. And it is an eerily, eerily fascinating performance. So let's take a look at 2015's Black Mass with Johnny Depp. What did you marinate the steak in? Because it's out of this world. Well, you're killing me with it. No, no. It's a family secret, huh? Come on, you gotta tell me that. What's the secret? Come on, you could do it. Come on. <laughs> Come on. That is one of the best goddamn steaks I ever had in my life, mm -hmm. ever. What's the what's the what's the fam what's the family secret recipe? It's gr it's ground garlic, and a little bit of soy. That's it. Yeah, that's it. That's it. I thought it was a family secret. <laughs> it's a recipe. No. No. You said to me, this is a family secret. And you gave it up to me, boom. Just like that. You spilled the secret family recipe today. Maybe you spill a little something about me tomorrow. Hmm? I was just saying that. You were just saying. Just saying gets people sent away. Just saying. Got me a nine year stretch in Alcatraz. You understand? So, just saying. Could get you buried real quick.
<laughs> Look at his face. <laughs> The thing that's troublesome, I don't know if troublesome is the right word, but the thing that makes Black Mass not your typical form of entertainment, at least for those of us in the Boston area, is the fact that it is so local. As the tag just said, the most notorious criminal in US history. Mm -hmm. um, it's fascinating to me how Johnny Depp tried multiple times to speak with the real life Balja mm -hmm. in preparation for the role but Balja kept turning him down. Balja did not want to meet with him. Yeah, and no, I don't no. know, I don't care what my paycheck is, I don't care what kind of publicity it would get for my film, I don't care if it would get me an Oscar nomination or what, but I don't know if I could, I don't know if I would just have the, I don't know if the I would gumption? have the, the gumption to, to meet with him, to, to re even consider meeting with meet him. With him. I, I, I think I would take it into my hands as, uh, let's be creative about this because I don't want to be in the same room with him. You know, you, you take a look at these journalists who will interview these these career criminals. You see, you know, Diane Sawyer interviewing Manson. You see all right. these people interviewing these sociopaths, and yes. you wonder how you know you you know that they're surrounded by the cameras, and yeah. so they're not alone in the room. But yeah. you still say to yourself, "My God, how can they?" That is something I don't think I could it's ever like bring myself like, to do. It's almost like I'm getting this image almost like Hannibal Lecter that's put away Oof. behind <laughs> behind yeah. bars and, and covered up. And, 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 yeah. yeah. No. But one thing about Johnny Depp was that they did say that uh, they brought in associates of his. They don't mention it who they were to to watch the filming, and they all said, "Yeah, that's Whitey. That's Whitey. That's Whitey." So I don't know. He 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 picked up mannerisms or whatever. I also read that he picked up uh, Boston accents from hanging out with Joe Perry. Aerosmith. Aerosmith. Joking. So, I mean, uh, it was, his performance was chilling. I mean, Jesus, uh, that, that's what kept you watching the movie because his, it was riveting. You have to keep saying to yourself, that's Johnny Depp, that's not Whitey Bulger, but he was as evil as he could possibly be in that movie. Well, the scenes where he was interacting with other gangsters, the scenes where he was interacting, you know, the scenes filled with violence, right. those were probably meant to be the most riveting scenes of the film, I suppose. But for me, what was even more effective were the scenes with silence, the scenes that were completely subdued, where mm -hmm. you just had his quiet intensity burning through. There is a scene yes, where right. he is a guest in somebody's home, I yes. won't say who, but the wife of this guest, played by Julianne Nicholson, she knows exactly who Bulger is, mm -hmm. and she does not like the fact that he is in her home. She goes upstairs to her bedroom, and he follows her, and the scene that subsequently plays right. out, he doesn't threaten her, he doesn't, well, he doesn't overtly threaten her. Yeah. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't do anything to her, mm -hmm. but he very, in a very smooth talking, in a very cold and calculating way, he makes sure that she knows that if she even dares to open her mouth to one person, right. that she is extremely vulnerable. Yeah, and, and he that actually for me was probably her. one of the most chilling scenes it of is. the whole film. It is, and then he actually touches her, and he's like, uh, and then she like, she's like holding her. He's know. caressing her hair, yeah, touching her cheek. Yeah, he's like closing the door, and she's like breathing, and it's crying, and like she can't believe that he finally <laughs> left. Yeah, so it's scary was, because. She plays, uh, she plays uh, the FBI agent's wife, and, uh, and he's the one that uh, is, 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 is like letting Whitey, you know, Bulger get away with all this, you know, actually mm. killing the mob and not getting, you know, not going after them, and he keeps, he keeps the FBI at bay from what's happening in Southie, and uh, until he ends up getting caught eventually, but um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a, uh, a very chilling movie. Um, it, in fact, uh, what was I going to say? I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, there's one thing I was going to talk about, but I can't remember what it was. Well, I mean, it is chilling in the sense that you have this true story that most of the real people involved t spoke to the film's truthfulness. Yeah, and as opposed to. Well, that mm -hmm. didn't happen. Oh, that's not right. Or yeah, 
And, and Johnny Depp actually watched this movie. He, he makes a habit of not watching his movies. And he said this was the best film um, role that he ever did. The best film, um, you know, he's proud of this more than anything he's ever done, which is like Pirates of the Caribbean, yeah. <laughs> Jack Sparrow. I mean, this, this, he's played, he's played a, a, a villain, uh, you know, a crime, in, in a crime story multiple times. He was Donnie Brasco. Right, Blow, Blow, and uh, Public Enemies, 2009's yeah. Public Enemies, where he plays John Dillinger, which yeah. was another, which was another, uh, yeah, great performance yeah. on his part. Oh, you know, the thing that I always thought was very chilling about this movie that I've just thought about is how he how he goes about dispassionately killing innocent people, the innocent ones, not the ones that you know could could do something to damage his, you know, could could hurt him. But people that are like, that he's afraid that somebody might do something. And he goes in like, like I mean, there's a chilling scene when he, he takes the young girl who's um, uh, the daughter of one of his associates or half daughter, brings her to a, like supposedly a safe house and then kills her with his hands. I think he strangles her. Yeah. And you know, yeah. so some of these scenes are like, Incredible, you know, difficult to watch. I would say very difficult. Yeah, viewer discretion advised. Viewer for that discretion one. advised. Very. Yeah, but I do want to mention Benedict Cumberbatch. Just yes. one last mo yes. note on him. Uh, yes. I mean, we're talking Sherlock. We're talking yes. the Snake in the Hobbit. We're talking. Yes, he you was know, Alan Turing from the Imitation Game. That's right. Benedict Cumberbatch plays his brother, and who you know who was the uh, he was the mayor, I believe it was, or the governor. Uh, uh, but he, he was. He was a state senator, a and state then he senator. became the chancellor of UMass. That's right, the, the chancellor Billy Bulger. of UMass. And yeah. he was very, uh, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, a very unlikely piece of casting there, but, yeah. but it, was, it, it worked. It he worked. had it down. Um, he, had, he had a better Boston accent, I thought, than, than and he's English. He's a, <laughs> he did a heck of a job. Across the pond. <laughs> yeah. No, so. he was excellent as his brother, and stood up for him, and defended him, and you could, just like, you know, we think that the real Billy Bulger probably did the same. It's amazing. How could you have black and white coming, or good and evil coming from the same family? It's just amazing, the different mm. paths that they took. Well, it brings us back to that notion of loyalty that you saw with the Boondock yeah. Saints. And I know. whether that loyalty is misguided or not is anybody's guess. Yeah, I know. And Black Mass, they said, was also a takeoff on, on Whitey's, Whitey Bulger being white, so that black. And then they said that Mass could have been a short for Massachusetts because they said that uh, this cr the crime that was endemic to South Boston and to mm. Mass, so. Yeah. But I guess that will bring us to the next movie, which is, um, it's blown away. And boy, is it blown away in this movie. It, it's, uh, it's, it's actually about um, Irish, re Irish, uh, Irish Republican Army, I guess, rebels back in, in Ireland. And it's about Tom, it stars Tommy Lee Jones and Jeff Bridges, and uh, Tommy Lee Jones in this movie is is, is a major villain. Um, he's a he, he actually makes bombs and he made a bomb that he ended up and Jeff Bridges was like his uh, well Tommy Lee Jones was Jeff Bridges' mentor, and he taught him how to make bombs when he was younger. So they made a bomb and they were going to set it and they set it off in Ireland and Jeff Bridges didn't realize it was going to be uh, in front in a crowded street and 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 he actually escaped and uh, Tommy Lee Jones character Ryan Garrity gets um, he gets apprehended by the police and gets thrown in jail and it, the, the movie starts with him escaping from jail and how he makes a bomb including out of someone's blood uh, so it's 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 a crime thriller in a different kind of way, and then what happens is it takes place in Boston because uh, Jeff Bridges' character escapes to Boston. Uh, his 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 name is Jimmy Dove in the movie, and Garrity is out to find Jimmy Dove, and he bring, goes to Boston, and uh, and now Jimmy Dove is part of a bomb squad. And his job is defusing bombs wherever they may be in Boston area. And Garrity goes there, and his and his he's determined to get rid of the bomb squad and one by one, and then get to Jimmy Dove. 
And so, uh, let's see the trailer for, for Bomb Blown Away. All right, here's what we've got. We're being bombed. Feds are coming up with zeros. Looks like our boys are mystery men. It's no mystery. His name's Ryan Garrity. According to the report, the guy can build bombs out of Bisquid. I've come here to create a new country for you called Chaos, and a new government called Anarchy. All for your own. The interesting thing about this movie is that Lloyd Bridges and Jeff Bridges' father was in the movie also. And they played, instead of being father and son, they played uncle and nephew. And uh, Lloyd Bridges is very instrumental in, tr in finding out about, trying to protect Jimmy Dove, and also um, at the same time trying to find out who's after the, the bombed people. And uh, he ends up getting in a difficult situation. He actually ends up <laughs> unfortunately getting blown away. And it happens in, um, in uh, Charlestown. I, there, it's, it's, a, they, it's a school, there's a school that's in there. And they actually, um, they, did def they, they, they blew up, I guess, some part of it or something before, you know, when it wasn't being used or something. And, and one of the things that happened is Jeff, uh, Jeff Bridges just missed getting some shrapnel into putting in, on his body, that's how, I mean, it was very realistically oh, wow. done. Wow. And, uh, and there, has to be, there happens to be a statue there of St. Sebastian that has arrows in it. And, um, and that's how they end up finding out the main clue about where in Boston, on the dock, Tommy Lee Jones you know, was hiding out and how they can find him. But the other th interesting thing about this movie is that Tommy Lee Jones followed this up from The Fugitive, where he played you know, the good guy. The, the, the sheriff out to catch, mm -hmm. you know, Harrison Ford, who was the fugitive in that movie. And, um, and he won the Oscar for that, Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah. For the fugitive, for the yeah, fugitive. Yeah, movie. But I, I hadn't remembered seeing him as a bad guy, but boy, he was a great villain in this movie. Very good movie. Yeah. Which brings us to our final film, um, Mystery Street, mm -hmm. which is a black and white 1950 film I guess you could say it falls into the category of film noir, but this is a story that really, it almost serves as not only a travelogue of Massachusetts because it takes you from Boston to Quincy to Hyannis to Harvard to Roxbury, it takes you all over. Not only is it a travelogue of Massachusetts, but it's also a time capsule of what Massachusetts used to look like. There are some exterior shots mm. of Harvard Square that really are mind-blowing when you think about this was before the counterculture movement of the 60s. This is before yeah. everything that you know has been in our lifetimes. So let's take a look at 1950s Mystery Street. The Boston Girl Mystery started. On the night of May 23rd, Vivian Heldon received a mysterious telephone call. Three hours later, Vivian Heldon disappeared, vanished from the face of the earth. What happened to the glamorous blonde? The answer becomes one of the most truly dramatic and amazing stories ever told on the screen. Murdered. 
murdered Vivian Heldon. The scientist said, don't be too sure. Then, circumstantial evidence drew its ever tightening net around the bewildered man. Are you all sure now? That's him, I'll swear that's the guy. He's lying, that man. Yeah, He's that's the one. Him. I never saw him before. He came to ask about Vivian. Now, climb him into the electric chair. Oh, no, darling, no. I made a lot of mistakes. Oh, but not that one. Here in this room is the answer. The facts behind the story. The clues that can send the man to the chair or prove him innocent. They are all here in the house on Mystery Street. The interesting thing about this movie was that it was the first commercial feature to be shot in Boston. That's what mm. they, you know, according to one of the critics, it was like 1950, so uh, that's one of the reasons that we decided to include it in this, besides the fact that it is a film noir and it's a great mystery. And the other interesting thing to me about it is that uh, Ricardo Montalban is the main lead in there. Uh, who we remember for Mr. Rourke from The Plane, The Plane, <laughs> Fantasy, <laughs> Fantasy Island. Island. <laughs> uh, but he was an up-and-coming star uh, for the studio, and, uh, you know, they, 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 they um, gave him the lead, and uh, the, the whole story is actually uh, in reverse because they have to find, the, the woman is actually killed, and they're actually finding out who the killer was from f forensic bone studies, because the skeleton is basically all that's left at the end, at the beginning of the movie. So they're working backwards with the Harvard professor, and, um, and, and, and uh, it's very interesting how they dig up the character, how they dig it up, but then, you know, there's also the other character, there's another character that's, um, I think his name's Marshall Thompson in there, and he's the one, he, he's the guy who everything points to as being the killer except the facts. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, it's a very interesting movie. I, I, you know, it, it could almost be updated to modern times um, because it's that interesting a movie and, and, and won Academy Award for Best Screenplay for that back then. Um, so uh, it's, a good, it's a good story. It's a good movie. Um, Elsa Lanchester's in there. She was a, a, a major, I guess, um, actress for that time period, playing the landlady. Um, and the way the clues are uncovered, it definitely keeps you interested in what's happening. And like you said, the, the scenes, are, everything takes, around, uh, takes place around Boston, around the Cape, hmm. and uh, it's mentioned in the movie, so it's a true Boston crime movie, I would, you know, as, you can go, as close as you can get. <laughs> There's even a reference to a hospital that no longer exists, the Boston Lying In Hospital. Oh, that's right. And as soon as they mentioned that hospital, I said, hey, that's the hospital where I was born. So oh, really? I was, yeah. I was uh, surprised to see that. I was mm -hmm. like, wow, who knew? I thought I was the only one who had ever heard of this place. <laughs> so, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, as the film opens, you have this prostitute. She is living in this it's sort of like a rooming house, and she's down on her luck. She needs money. She goes to a bar. She picks up this drunk man. She manages to get him to give her his keys, and she's driving him around, and then she is the character in question. I mean, this is all within the first 10, 15 minutes of the film, so it's not a plot spoiler, right. but she is, uh, I won't say by whom, but uh, as it turns out, she is shot, and so the premise of the film is you have these skeletal remains of this prostitute found along the beach, and so they use this DNA, this forensic science mm. uh, methodology to try to figure out what happened and at whose hands, and it's a concept that really was revolutionary for 1950, so not only do yeah. you have this fresh look at this state of Massachusetts that had not really been depicted too, too much on film before at that point. It's um, like CSI Massachusetts. CSI Massachusetts, <laughs> 1950s style. Yeah, yeah. So. so those are the films that we have to take a look here at mm -hmm. Boston Crime Thrillers, and so we definitely want to send a uh, very sincere hearty thank you to Roxanne Moss, who is... Our ace director. The ace director. So thank you, Roxanne. 
And I have and a question for you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you say that you're from New York. Yeah. Well, yeah I was that's what you were telling Jersey. me at first, or were you lying? Oh, New Jersey. I grew up in Jersey originally. Oh, but, so when you were lying by that dumpster there, you were posing as a uh, true New Yorker. Uh, not a real New Yorker. Not, not New anymore. New Yorker. No, I'm a Boston guy. Do you drink Starbucks? I like I like Dunkin' Donuts actually. Okay, then there's and hope so for you yet. I, I'm not I'm not totally uh, no actually I, I'm a huge Boston Red Sox fan. Yeah. You know, I'm a typical Massachusetts jerk. That's why I'm asking. I want to put you on the spot like that. Good luck with our rotaries. And I have one uh -huh. last question. That okay. hat of yours is that legit, New York? Nah. I knew it. I'm a Boston guy. That's what I said. Well, and. Uh, Thank you for That's tuning it. in. That's right, Tim. Thanks, right. And yeah. until next time. We will see you on real life movies.